Evening, you may be seated. And while you're getting your seats, if you want to grab your Bible, uh, we're looking at the book of Job as we continue in our series, Big God, Big Picture. We're getting a bird's eye view of each of the books of the Bible. And I personally have been enjoying them. I hope that you have been too. If you miss any, you can always go back to our website and look at them. And, uh, and listen to them. They're, they're posted at no cost. Um, let me just invite you, maybe some of you have been uh, logging on online, and if you have and miss our introduction, I just want to encourage you right now, if you would just simply like and share on Facebook, invite your family and friends to join us as we study God's Word. Uh, so we're in the book of Job. Sunday we are going to continue in our study of the book of Acts, and we're going to look at the persecuted church. So here we are uh, looking at Job, a man who suffered immensely, and now, and on, excuse me, and then on Sunday, we're going to look at the church who uh, will be persecuted uh, for their belief in God. So it is not easy sometimes being a believer. Uh, it's not a, you know, you give your life to God and you live happily ever after, and that's simply not true. Uh, but the good thing is, no matter what we go through, hey, listen, Jesus is with us, and that makes all the difference. So uh, let's ask the Lord to bless our study. Father, we, as we open your word, we also open our hearts to receive in your word. I pray your blessing upon it. I pray you, you bless those who, who purpose in their heart to set aside this time to study your word. And again, I ask for your revelation as well as your blessing on all those who will hear and receive and, uh, and obey what you have in it. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are in the book of Job. I think those of you who are familiar with the book of Job knows that, well, it's a book of suffering. What Job has gone through, I don't think any person on the face of the planet will say, you know what, that's something I want to do. I want to suffer like Job. I think people will actually stay away from this book because they think that, well, if I read it, it might happen to me, you know? <laughs> and, and, and it's really a wonderful book. It's a, uh, as they, well, let me just say this. I believe some scholars believe, I believe a great amount of scholars believe that this is the oldest book in the entire Bible. It's before Genesis. Um, Job was, if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 46, we see the genealogy of Jacob and one of his sons in verse, uh, let me see here, in verse 14, it says the son of Ishkar was Tola, uh, Puva, Job. So we see Job in here. And some believe that this is the very same Job that wrote the book of Job. And so if this is, the, in fact, the, the Job, then we know that he's after uh, Jacob, but he is before Moses. Now, Moses, keep in mind, wrote the first five books of the Bible, starting with Genesis. So if that's the case, then we believe that Job is uh, er, written earlier than what Moses wrote. Uh, so Job is considered one of the books of poetry. We know we have Job, we have Psalms, we have Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And some would even throw in their lamentation. But Job speaks of how to suffer. Psalms speak of how to pray. Proverbs speaks of how to act. Ecclesiastes speaks of how to enjoy the Song of Solomon speaks of how to love. But here we are in how to suffer. <laughs> how do you suffer as a believer? How do you suffer and not turn your back on God or become bitter? Listen, as we look at these, what we consider senseless tragedies, I believe that it will give us some sense of, of what, what, what in the world are we doing here? Why? Why do we see so many tragedies, and what, what are we to make out of it? You know, when we see, I remember a couple of years ago, I heard this story, 
news article where this young lady who was pregnant, and she was taking, I believe, her daughter to school, and as she stopped at a stop sign, some drunken driver came and slammed into her, killed her, her unborn child, and her daughter. And you listen to things like that, and it's kind of like, why? <laughs> what? And, and the crazy thing is, as they died, the whole, you know, the family died, the person who did it, the drunk driver, well, of course, he walked away without a scratch. And of course, it makes you scratch your head and say, God, what, does, what sense does this make? Why does it seem like bad things happen to good people? Now, there's no easy way to answer that. It's probably one of the oldest questions in the entire world. Certainly, it's a question that I'm sure Job wrestled with. When you look at Job chapter 1, we look at the Job the man. In chapter 1, verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Job was a righteous man, an upright man. He was one that we would consider a good man. And today, well, we will say that he was a Christian, but of course that was back pre-Christianity. But here's a man that, that was, you know, faithful to the Lord. And when you look at Job's life, well, we know that he had a family. He was a family man in verse 2, we are told. He had ten children, five, excuse me, seven boys, three girls, and Job loved his children. In fact, in verses 4 and 5, we're told that how he offered burnt offerings when they, they had their party, and just in case they sinned, Job would offer sacrifices to the Lord on their behalf. You see, Job was a family man. Job was an upright man. Job was a man of integrity. And in, in verse 3, we see that he was also a prosperous man. In verse 3, we are told that also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 ox, yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Uh, you know, Job was stinking rich. <laughs> all of the animals that he had, all the servants he had, he was very, very wealthy. So we see he was a family man. He was an upright man. He was a man of integrity. He was a man that was prosperous. And most would look on and say, man, Job is living a life. God has blessed him because he's a good guy. Isn't that what we often think when someone is doing good, when they're living for the Lord? that the automatic thing to happen to them is that God will bless them. And so we look at it and say, surely God has blessed him, blessed Job, because he is good. He's a good man. Now, we're also told in chapter 1 that Satan was out looking for trouble. We're told that he was going back and forth through the earth, and, you know, as the scripture says, that the devil, he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. And so when he came before God, uh, God said, hey, have you considered my servant Job? You know, uh, in verse 8, if you want to look at it, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on all the earth, a blameless and upright man who... Uh, excuse me, one who fears God and shuns evil. You get the sense that God is like, man, this, is, this guy impresses me. I love Job, you know. Job is an upright man. I, I don't think there's anyone on the face of the planet like Job. But look what Satan says in his response in verses 9 through 11. He's basically saying the only reason that Job is serving you is because you have blessed him and that you are protecting him. You know, they take away all of his possessions, take it all away, and surely, he says, that Job will curse you. The only reason he's, he's serving you is because you have blessed him. So God said, okay, well, I'll give you permission. Take away his possession. Take away all that he have. And we see in the life of Job that tragedy strikes. 
And it was as if one story, one person after another, before one person is even finishing their sentence, they come with more bad news. And we're told that how the raiders came and they stole all of his oxen and his donkeys. And, and then a fire came and, uh, from heaven and, and all of his sheep was destroyed. And we heard that raiders came and stole all of his camels and killed all of his servants. And we're told that a tornado or whirlwind came and the house that his children was in, they all died. Again, one after another, before one could finish sharing what they were sharing, someone came and gave more bad news. And again, the worst of all, to hear that his children, all ten, lost their lives. But Job's remarkable response in verse 21 and 22 of chapter 1, it says, And he said, listen, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, it says, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. So Satan attempt to cause Job to sin against God, it failed. You know, when we look at just this opening chapter, I think some people have real serious questions. Well, how can God allow this to happen to Job? If God really loved him, shouldn't he protect him from the devil? Why would he allow it? Why would he allow his children to die? Why would he allow his, all of these things to happen? And the worst part, I believe, is, well, I'll come back to that. I won't give you that now. But in chapter 2, we see Satan, because he failed, uh, he came back to God and said, God, surely, if Job would lose his health, surely he will curse you then. And so in chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and it said that he struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a, a potsherd with which to, to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of ashes. Could you imagine boils all over Job? He lost everything that he had. He lost his family. And now his health has gone bad. And surely Job is probably thinking, oh, did I do something wrong? He's there in the, you know, scraping this oozing pus of, you know, of boils on his skin. And in verse 10 it says, But he said to her, that's his wife, because his wife was left, she didn't die. Satan took all of Job's wealth and his children, and, his, and he left his, can I say this, his nagging wife to torture him. Because in chapter, 10, chapter 2, verse 10 it says, you, you speak as one, the foolish woman speaks, shall we indeed accept good from God and Shall we not accept adversity in all this Job did not sin with his lips? You see, his wife came and said, why don't you curse God and die? You, you, you know, you, you're suffering all of this. You lost everything and you're still saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so Job said, oh, woman, you're speaking foolishly. And, then he, you know, again, the question that was asked is, shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In other words, we have this tendency to say, well, you know, I, I was driving and I escaped this, this accident, and so because I was able to escape it, then God blessed me and he, he protected me. So this is good. I'm, I'm a blessed person. But then you have the other side where we have believers as well that was travel the same road and, and get caught up in an accident and, you know, again, lose their life or end up in a hospital. So what do we say about that person? Is it because they're bad? Or is it just because, well, again, we will answer some of those questions. But one of the greatest fallacies that we as believers, as people, we believe that only those who are healthy, wealthy, and wise, are blessed. And if, a bad things, if bad things are in your life, it's because you have committed some sin, 
and God is out to get you. As if he's someone in, in heaven just waiting so that he can just slap you across your, the back of your head when you mess up. And that's the view that people have of God. But listen, good things happen to good people as well as bad people. Jesus made it clear that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. If you went outside today, I'm sure you got rained on. <laughs> it, it falls on the, the just and the unjust. You know, some of you are familiar with Ravi Zacharias, one of my favorites. I refer to him as, you know, personally, he's kind of a hero of the faith. And I look up to him, but he just passed away two, two weeks ago now from a rare um, spinal, injury, spinal uh, cancer. And this man was a champion of the faith. He was an apologist where he went out and, and he talked about some of these hard subjects, sharing truth in these, you know, and light in these areas. And here it is that he died from something, and a lot of, I mean, his testimony, he shared of how he had, I believe, broken his back a, a number of years ago, and he, in, he experienced such pain. And yet, he didn't turn against God and say, God, why? No, he continues to serve the Lord. So Job's question, why did God allow me to be born, is one of the questions he asked. You know, if God knew that I was going to suffer so much and lose so much, why would he allow me to even be born? And people ask that question all the time. You know, if God knew that I was going to suffer all these heartaches and pain, why would he even create humanity? You ever had that thought? Ever had that question? Maybe someone asked you that question. And it's one of those questions that, you know, it would be nice if we had an easy answer, but there's no easy answer. But even looking at Ravi Zacharias, one of the things that he shared, and I just thought was so profound, he said, if you think about it this way, that there are really just a couple of theories on the existence of man. You know, as God created this world, and of course, he could have created, uh, well, he could have not created anything. It could just be, you know, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit enjoying a, a relationship of unity and love. And he could just choose not to have created anything, anything in this known universe. But a second option is that God could have created a world with no such thing as good and evil. So if he created a world with no such thing as good and evil, then I guess he will just have to not create us. <laughs> because who is the evil ones? Well, we are. We're the evil ones. And of course, we often want to blame someone else and blame shift. But the reality, he could have created a world with no such thing as good and evil. But a third option is that God could have created a world where you can only choose good with, with no choice of choosing evil. What do you call that? Well, if you program someone, well, that's a computer. And if you create a computer, you cannot expect the computer to love you. You can program the computer to say, I love you. I love you, God. You know, you, you're going to get that, but it won't be true love because it will be programmed. You see, in order for love to happen, it has to be a choice. And so the fourth option that Ravi Zachariah proposed is that God could create a world where there is good and evil. And only the only world where love is possible. In the world that we live in, this is the only world that, we, that, that, that makes it possible for love to be possible. Without good and evil, without evil, without choice, well, we can't choose uh, a God because he had programmed us to just do whatever he, whatever he tells us to do. So the only way, the only possibility for us to love is for us to have a choice. And that's what God has given us. So I believe that, you know, to answer the question, you know, if God knew that we were going to suffer all these heartaches and pain, why would he create us? Again, I believe because of love. If you think about it, the Bible says that God is love. And love, well, self-love is no love at all. 
But I'll tell you what, when we love someone, when we invite someone into our lives and share life together, that's true love. And so God loves us so much that he was willing to take that risk. And I don't know if you like that word for taking a risk for love, but that's what we do all the time. How many of us got married? Well, we're taking a risk. <laughs> Would she love me for the rest of my life as, as, as she stood before the altar and say, until death do us part? How, how will I know she won't, you know, will, will continue to be faithful? How will I know? I don't know. I'm taking a risk. But even in the same sense, I'm taking a risk when we have children. How do I know that evil won't happen to them? Or in a sense, they won't turn evil. There's a risk that we're taking, but there's a risk that the reward will be love. And so God chose to take that risk to put us into this world, hoping that we will make the right decision by choosing to have a love relationship with him. But I believe also a, another explanation of why God will allow suffering and heartache and pain is because well, we have to have an eternal perspective. We have to have eternity in, in view. If we look at this world just on, you know, based on this time that we live in, you know, we are born and we die 70, 80 years old, whatever it is. If we just look at it from that perspective and all of the problems that we go through in this life, all of the heartaches and the pain and the difficulty, you know, to be born and go through trouble and and you know, all that what we go through and then die, if that's it, then it makes no sense. Why live at all? Why not take our life uh, when we're going through these things? Because we live and we die. But if we have eternity in view, if we know that after this life, as God says, that he will reward us for how we live this life and what we have done with it, then we know that, well, the, the trouble and the trials, as the apostles will say, you know, the momentary trials that we're going through, it pales in comparison to the glory, the blessings that we'll receive in heaven. And so, yes, we suffer, but man, I have hope. I have hope that this is not it. And so Job, as he was in chapter 3, just asking all kinds of questions, God, you know, why even create me? Why did you even make me born into this world where I, where I will suffer so much. Now, in chapter 4 through 37, Job had some good old faithful friends. Not. They came by to help Job to answer his questions, to give an explanation why he is suffering so much. So he had three friends that are going to give three arguments each. So we have a total of nine arguments covering from chapter 4 through chapter 37. I'm going to look at the first three arguments, and then the others you can read for home. But in chapter 4, we see his first friend, his name, Eliphaz. In verse 7 of chapter 4, it says, Remember now, whoever perishes being innocent, or where, oh, excuse me, or where were the upright ever cut off, even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reaps the same. In other words, in other words, he, he's saying good people don't suffer, Job. And so that the only logical explanation for why you're suffering is because you're bad. <laughs> you have done something wrong, you have sinned, and you're paying for what you have done. Now, of course, this is uh a fallacy is really not true at all. Again, you know, we know that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Now, Job, uh, well, in chapter 5, verse 8, he also said, If, if I were you, I would pr pr uh, present my case to God. You know, go and plead your case to God. Go and, and basically confess to the Lord. Plead your case to Him. Now, Job responds in chapter 6. He responds to his friend Eliphaz. He said, uh, basically in verses 1 through 13, that no one could understand how his heavy burden 
how heavy his, his situation is, how heavy it is. You know, to lose your family, to lose your wealth, to lose your health. And the only person that's behind, that's left behind is your wife saying, curse God and die. He said, no one could understand. And his friends are there, and he's basically pleading with them, can you guys just listen and understand what I'm, what I'm going through? You know, sometimes we can be so cold, or sometimes we can feel like we got everything figured out. You know, someone is suffering. Let me go and tell them what's wrong in their life. Let me go try to fix them by giving them my words of wisdom. And all Job is, is basically asking is, can you guys just listen and sympathize with the pain that I'm going through? In verse 14 to 21, he says, what, what, we, what he need, basically, is dependable friends. Friends that would listen. And, and they would listen more than they will talk. You know? In verse 22, 30, he talks about, uh, you know, how he need a friend or he need friends that are there to comfort him and not to criticize him. Now, we're going to listen to some of the criticism that his friends will, will throw at him. And, I mean, if you make this mistake and say some of these things, oh, I hope we will learn a lesson from Job's friends of what not to do when someone is going through a difficult time, whether it's loss of life, loss of a child, or their health has gone bad. So in chapter 7, um, Job is going to complain about how difficult his life can be. Uh, you know, he basically says in this chapter, you work all day waiting for a paycheck, and then you stay up all night hoping that the next day will be better than yesterday. And then he talks about how, you know, when you get sick and there is no relief, it just, you know, going through this life is just really hard and difficult. And he cries out to God in verse 16 of chapter 7. He says, I loathe or I hate my life. When you see someone come to that point where they say they hate their life, you know that they're going through such pain and such a struggle. He said, I hate my life. And he said, I would, I would not live forever. Let me alone for my days are a, a but a breath. Job felt like God was unjustly punishing him, and he's like, I wish he would just take my life. And I've heard people say those things. I, I, I just don't see the purpose of living. Again, if you just have a, a, a here and now mentality without e eternity in view, if you don't understand the love of God, you will have these words come out of your mouth. So Job complained, but in chapter 8, his second friend, Bildad, he came around, and, uh, and, and here's what he says. Listen, this is the most insensitive thing that anyone could ever say to someone who lost a child or even a couple of children. He said, it's really the sins of your children. That's why they died. In verse 4, he says, if your sons have sinned against him, that is God, he has cast them away for their transgression. The man is grieving, he is hurting, and here we have these, this friend that says, it's your children's fault, they've sinned, that's why. Oh, how insensitive that is. So he believed if, if Job would stop being a hypocrite, that God will forgive him. If Job would just attempt just to, to admit that he have sinned, and that if he admit that, that his children have sinned, that then God will stop punishing him for that. Now, in chapter 9 and 10, Job replies to Bildad. He says, again, Job, in this chapter, he, he's, he basically says, I know I'm not sinless. No one is sinless. But it is not... I'm not guilty of the things that you're accusing me of. There's nothing great or sinful that I have done that, that will cause God to come down and, and punish me like this. So he's maintaining that, that he's innocent. So Job, in chapter 10, he puts on a mock trial. Basically, if I could stand before God, this is what I would say. You ever hear people say, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven so I can talk to God and tell him, 
a piece of my mind? <laughs> That's Job. In chapter 10, this is what he's doing. He, he said, if, if Job could have his day with God, what will he say? Well, Job felt like God was mad at him uh, for, uh, you know, well, excuse me, that Job made him for the purpose of waiting for him to sin so that he can punish him. That's what Job was thinking, you know, that if he could stand before God, that he could just tell God, you know, why would you make me so that you can just punish me? You know, you feel, uh, you know, do you, do you take pleasure in it, in a sense, that he's saying? And once again, he felt like it would have been better for him to be stillborn. And so people actually feel that way. They feel like that, that God is a big dictator in the, in the heaven just waiting for us to mess up so he can just zap us and do evil to us. So Job, after this mock trial, um, in chapter 11, we see the third friend, Zophar. Uh, he was obviously upset with Job because of the things that Job was responding. And here's what he did. He accused Job of being a babbler instead of repenting. You should stop saying those things, Job, and just repent. Stop babbling on and saying all these things. And in verse 6 of chapter 11, he basically said God is punishing him, or God would have punished him less than, than his iniquity deserves. In other words, Job, you're really getting, getting off good. You have sinned. You obviously have done something. God is gracious to you. You should be punished more. Talk about how insensitive these guys are. The man has lost so much, and yet they're, they feel like they're some expert to come and, and give a word of wisdom and fix Job up. And in chapter 12, we see Job again respond to Zophar, his friend. In chapter 12, verse 2, listen to what he says. No doubt you are the people, and the wisdom will die with you. In other words, he is saying, you guys think you know everything. And that once you die, then all the wisdom of the world will die with you because you think you figured it all out. So Job argues at this point that basically God is sovereign and that it is up to him if he wants to bless or punish someone. God is in full control and, and it's up to him to bless or punish. And he, de he determines that, which we know that God is sovereign. And so is it true that God would just bless who he wants and, and, and curse who he wants? Is that what God does? And so that's his argument. And so in chapter 13, listen to what Job says to his friends, and I love it. Because after all the... the you know, advise the wisdom that they're trying to give Job. Job turns to them and now in, in chapter 13, verse 1, he says, look, I'm reading from the NL, NLT, the New Living Translation, because I think it really captures it here. He said, look, I have seen all this with my own eyes and heart uh, and with my own ears, and now I understand. I know as much as you do. You are no better than I. In other words, you guys think you know so much. You're not different from I, from myself. I've seen everything that you have seen. I've heard everything you've heard. You're no different. Then he says in verse 3, As for me, I would speak directly to the Almighty. I want to argue my case with God himself. As for you, guys, my friends, you smear me with lies. As physicians, you are worthless quacks. <laughs> Job says, guys, you guys are quacks. You're giving me advice, but it's worthless. Verse 5, if you, if only, listen, if only you could be silent, <clears throat> that's the wisest thing you could do. Listen to my charge. Pay attention to my argument. Job is saying, you guys are talking too much. If you would listen, you will understand what I'm going through. So in chapter 14, Job Jo excuse me, I'm saying job. Job. You always know when someone is not a, a Christian when they refer to the book as, of job. <laughs> so Job pleaded with God in chapter 14 to give him relief. In, in verse 18 to 21 of chapter 14, he expresses doubt that God will do anything. So he's saying, 
God, if you will just give me a relief, but then again, I don't know if you're going to do anything. I don't know if you'll give me the relief. So in chapter 15 through 37, we're not going to go through all of these, but they bring another, the second and a third round of arguments against Job. They question his wisdom in chapter 15. They accuse him of being melodramatic in chapter 18, verse 4. They accuse him of saying things that are offensive. Listen, Job is the one that's suffering, and he's pleading his case, and they're like, man, you're offending me. <laughs> and in chapter 22, verses 5 through 11, they accuse him of taking advantage of the poor. Job is because you're, you're rich, and, and you, you loan money to people, and you, you took their clothes from them. You, you didn't leave them with anything. What kind of man are you? That's why God is punishing you. So they're making all these arguments against Job. And in their pursuit to use wisdom and understanding uh, and to understand suffering, uh, Job makes a great conclusion, a great concluding observation. So in, in chapter 28, verse 12, listen to what he says. But where can wisdom be found? So here it is again. He's asking, where can we find wisdom? I'm going through this suffering. Where can I get understanding? His friends are obviously are trying to give him understanding, and he's, he's basically saying, you guys are not helping me here. So he's asking the question, where can wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Verse 13, man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. When we ask those hard questions, those difficult questions, why does God allow good things to happen to bad people? I like to say, why does God allow bad things or, well, bad things to happen to bad people, right? Uh, good things to happen to bad people, actually. You know, when, when we ask these questions, sometimes the answers to these questions is not found here on earth. You have to go to God. Only God knows. Because if, if we try to use our little puny mind to understand how this universe works, you think about the simple fact that God will even come towards the end of this book and argue for himself, and you consider that God spoke this world into, into existence. We can't comprehend that. I look at some things, you know, I look at, at, at the, the, the computer, the iPhone, and, and whatever, and I'm like, how in the world are they, they, they storing all this memory on a little chip that's the size, the size of a grain of sand? They know, and yet that's nothing compared to what God does. And so Job is saying, we're looking and trying to understand how this is all going to work, how it's, how, how, where is the problem coming from? Job is saying, the real answer is found in heaven, not here on earth. God is the one that has the answer. So in chapter 30, excuse me, 29 to 31, Job will give some closing arguments. Job would argue and maintain in chapter 31, that he is innocent. He's not guilty of the things that they were charging him or accusing him of. In verse 1 of chapter 31, he says these things. He says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? In other words, he's like, I haven't lusted after anyone. I have made a covenant with my eye, so therefore I know I'm innocent in that area. In verse 5, he says, I have walked with I, 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 excuse me, if I have walked with falsehood or deceit. In other words, I, I, I'm not a man that goes around lying and using deceit. So I, I'm innocent of that. In verse 16 and, and verse 21, he says, Have I refused to help the poor or crush the, the hopes of the widows or, or, in, or orphans? In other words, he have helped people. He haven't stolen from them. He's a, 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 a man of, of uprightness. So all of the things that he has been accused for, Paul, uh, Job is saying, I'm innocent of those things. In chapter 32 to 34, we're introduced to a fourth friend. So this friend had been sitting by, just basically listening to the arguments of Job's three friends. He has listened to the arguments of Job. And now he comes in to give some counsel. And here's what he, in a sense, says. 
He says, basically, Job, you're wrong for blaming God for your difficulty. And he turned to his friends and said, you guys are wrong for blaming Job unjustly. So basically, you're all wrong, is what he says, which what he's sharing is some good information, but he offers no explanation of why Job was suffering the way that he was suffering. So he basically just said, hey, you're all wrong, but who knows? Don't have the answer. So since Job was wrong and since his friends was wrong and his fourth friend here is not given any real answer, then where will the answer come from? Well, in chapter 38 is where God comes in and says, let me give you some answers. So Job is being questioned by God in chapter 38. And basically God comes in and says, Job, you want to debate with me? Because that's what Job was essentially saying. If I have my day in court with God, if I can stand before him and plead my case, this is what I will say. And so God is saying, you want to debate with me, Job? You want to demand something from me? You want to demand some answers? And here's what God says in chapter 38, verse 3. He says, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. <laughs> you want to question me, Job? Let me ask you the questions. You think you're a man? You think you're grown? As often parents will say to their kids, you think you're grown? <laughs> I'll take you of you, right? And so God is turning the table on Job and said, let me ask you some question. In chapter 38, verse 4, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me. If you have understanding, who determines its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the, the line upon it? To what were its foundation fastened? Or who laid its cornerstones? When the morning stars sang together and all the songs of God shouted for joy? Verse 8, or who shut, who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb, when, when I made the, the clouds its garments and thick darkness its, sw its swaddling band, when I fixed my limits for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you, sh you may come, but no further, and, where you pro uh, and, and here you, your proud waves must stop. You see, God was saying, Job, let me remind you what I have done. Let me remind you that I am the one that created the world. I have measured it. Uh, no one was there. You weren't there. When you look at the sea, or when you go and walk and stand next to the ocean, and you see the waves, you know, beating against the shore, who, who told it where to stop? I did. Where were you, Job? Do you understand how that all works? You see, God turned it around, and he's asking all these questions and so much more. And when God was finished, when God was finished revealing his glory and his majesty to Job, listen in verse 5 of chapter 42, it says that, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, Job is saying, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in the dust and ashes. In other words, Job, it, it, you know, is saying, I take everything that I have said, I take it back, Lord. I repent. You see, God is saying, this, this life, trying to explain it to you, is too complicated for you, Job. It's too complicated for you, Christian. I know you're trying to figure it out, but if I try, you won't understand. If you think about it, just for a moment, that God, when you get up in the morning and you pray, and you say, God, this is my whatever issue that you're facing, and you give him your list, your shopping list of the things that you want him to do or need to accomplish in your life, but you have millions, if not billions of people on the face of the planet that God is listening to all at the same time. You ever had two kids talk to you, try to get your attention at the same time, and you're just like, quiet. I need to hear one at a time. But yet God is, is listening to the billions of people, and 
rotate in this earth that spins about 1,000 miles an hour, that goes around the sun, you know, how many millions of miles per hour, that goes around this universe, the universe is spinning by billions of miles per hour, <laughs> and God is holding it all together and answering your prayers, and he's working at all things together for good, and then you want him to explain life to you? Listen, you won't understand. You don't try to talk to your brand new baby and try to teach them quantum physics or something like that. They're not going to get it. You can't get it. We can't get it. So it leaves us to say, you know what, God? You're sovereign, and I'm going to trust you. And so the book closes with a couple of things that's worth highlighting. In chapter 42, God, we're told, that was angry with Job's friend because they, they, they did not accurately represent him in the things that they were saying about God concerning Job, of how he's treating Job. They're, they're saying things that were not true, so God is not too pleased with them. And so guess what he does? He doesn't strike them dead. You know what he does? He tells Job to pray for them to make sacrifices for them, which is very interesting. And, you know, you can look at that in, chapters 40, in chapter 42, verse 7 through 10. But in chapter 42, verse 10, the Lord says, And the Lord restored Job losses when he prayed for his friends. When did he restore his losses? When Job was obedient to him. In other words, all that Job lost, God is going to restore it double fold. But it began with when he, began, he, he was obedient to God, that he prayed for his friends. Did you, do you think Job was happy with his friends at this point? No, he wasn't. And sometimes God will have us pray for what we will call sometimes our enemies. Oh, they did this, they say this. What do God want us to do? Well, he, Jesus told us to pray for your enemies. That's what we're to do. So... In verse 10, he says, pray for them. He restored them. And then it says, indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So Job had 7,000 sheep. You know what? He gave him 14,000 sheep. He had 500 oxen. He gave him 1,000 oxen. He had 3,000 donkeys. He had now had 6,000 donkeys. He had 500, um, I mean, excuse me, 3,000 camels. He had now had... 6,000 camels, 500 donkeys, now we have 1,000 donkeys. But check this part out. We know that he's restoring him double. Well, what about his children? He had 10 children, 7 sons, 3 daughters. Guess what? Job received another 7 sons and 3 daughters. Notice that it didn't say that he received 14, I mean, excuse me, uh, 14 sons and 6 daughters, so 20 children. It said that he just gave him seven. Why is that? You see, Job didn't lose his children. Where are they? They're in heaven. You see, when we pass from this life, we go into, the, into heaven. We don't lose our friends, our family, when they die in the Lord. So God is saying in this one statement, Job, you have children in heaven. You have family in heaven. You haven't lost them. You see, that, need, that should bring some comfort to us. Because when we do lose a family, oh, we grieve so much. And yes, it hurts. It hurts greatly. But again, we have to think eternal, eternity that we haven't lost them. But instead, in Job's case, he have gained even more. So now Job has 40, uh, excuse me, 20 kids, 20 family members. And so God restored Job twice the amount that he had lost. And then here's the amazing part, and it's easy to miss this, but to show how gracious God was and God is, I should say, think about the words that Job's wife made. She said, Job, you're standing here in your integrity. Why don't you curse God and die? And how did God respond to Job's wife? Well, we're here we see that she had seven, uh, 10 more children. God didn't punish her, but God blessed her, regardless of how she responded. And so the book closes 
with these words, for verse 16 and 17 of chapter 42. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his grandchildren for four generations. Verse 17, so God, excuse me, so Job died old and full of days. You see, I can summarize the book of Job with two statements. The first statement is, bad things do not happen, did not happen to Job because he was bad. Again, bad things did not happen to Job because he was bad. Understand this, Job was a victim of living in a fallen, sinful world. He was robbed. The people who robbed him, they were sinful. They are a product of us being in a sinful world. We saw the natural disaster, a whirlwind. Natural disaster is a product from living in a sinful world. We saw that he was given this disease. Listen, disease before Adam and Eve did not exist. He is a victim of living in a sinful world. So, Job, bad things did not happen to him because he was bad. But the second statement I will close here with is good things did not happen to Job because he was good. We look at Job and say, oh, Job was such a good guy. Well, how do you define good? If you define good based on your comparing yourself with your neighbor or your spouse, well, of course, you're, you're great, you're fantastic. But if you compare yourself with God, well, we're nowhere near being good. And so good things did not happen to Job because he was good. The reason why good things happened to Job is because he was a recipient of God's grace, which we all are. The reality is if God had to give us what we deserve, we'd all be dead from the moment that we were born because we were born in sin. We won't even make it that far because our, our parents, well, he will take them out too. Right, Naomi? So, um, I'm calling them out. <laughs> so, we are blessed because of the goodness of God. God has given us so much. And that's why every day that we wake in this world, we should be giving praises to God. Amen. Lord, in the words of Job, I know my Redeemer lives. We have a mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ, who pleads our case before the Father. And he doesn't go to the Father and say, Father, he's innocent. No, instead he says, oh, that Christian, John, Job, Kathy, Linda, whoever it is, Lord, Father, they're guilty. But Lord, I will, uh, Father, I want to plead their case. I want to say that even though they're guilty, I have lived the perfect sinless life. And so therefore, I've given them the righteousness. I've died in their place. And Lord, therefore, you need to see them through my blood, through my life. Our Redeemer lives. And he has redeemed us from the curse of sin. And even though we're in this world and we're still experiencing the effects of sin, the disease and the disasters, and all of these things that we deal with on a daily basis, we know that one day, one day, and I believe very soon, that our Lord, our Redeemer, will come through those clouds and He will take us to be with Him in the air, to live with Him forever, where there will be no more death, no more sin, no more disease, no more pain, no more crying, and forever we will be with Him. So, Lord, we thank You. Thank You for the hope that we have in Christ. We give You thanks and praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't God's word good? Oh, people don't know what they're missing out when they stay at home to watch television. <laughs>
Let's stand and close in a song.